Dr. Lance O'Sullivan, who is based in Kaitaia as a G GP, who is a passionate advocate for Māori health. Thank you. Ati hei Māori ora tuatahi e tau to kona hanga mihi ko mihi no reira e te matua tini te mihi atu ki a koe mo to ta te karaki a faka tui fira tini tini wa mihi ana ki a koe ano mo to to mihi ki a ki a matau ki tini kau papa hoki no reira e reui tini te mihi atu ki a koe e huri ana e huri ana o ta te fakaro ki a rata ko fitu rangi tia a rata o te ni rohi o te na rohi o te ra rohi pita no te matu e ngā mate haere, haere hoki atu koutou. I tēnei wā, huriana ngā mihi kia ki tō tātou kingi tūheitia, e noho ana ki te ahuru watapu ona mātua tūpuna, koutou hoki, te kāhui ariki, pai marere. I tēnei wā, mihi ana ki a koutou o te whare wānanga nei o Waikato, o koutou ngā kai whakahaere, ngā tūmwaki o tēnei whare wānanga, tēnā koe Alistair, ko rua hoki Linda, a koutou katoa ko a karanga mai ki a hau ki te hau mai i tēnei wā, a ki te hāpa ki te tautou ko tēnei kaupapa, kaupapa nui ara ko te rā ki ngitanga. Nō rei mihi ana ki a koutou ko rātou hoki ngā tauira o te whare wānanga nei, a i tikana ngā kōrua ko rātou ngā rangatira mo a pōpō. Ko tōku mihi whakamutunga ki a koutou katoa, koutou mai ngā koko ngā whātou matu, a tēnā koutou rau rangatira mā, kau mātou kuia, pakeke hoki tauira koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ko wai tēnei tuana kei mui a koutou, ko moi hau ki waho ko te araha ko yuta, ko tika pato moana ko haura ki te whenua, Ko Ngāti Maru te iwi, Ngāti te auti te hapu, ko tainu i te waka, ko Mātai Whetu te marae ko Wātene te whānau, a ko Lantai Sullivan e tūana ke mui a koutou. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kero mai tātou katoa. Just to say... Thank you very much for the opportunity, Linda, to come along here today to you and your staff, to the University of Waikato, to help celebrate this day, this important day of the Kingitanga. Uh, I, I am really, really excited to be here today and, and share a little bit about who I am. And, and I hope I don't bore you too much about uh, telling you a little bit about who I am that you may not know already. A little bit about what drives me and what, what are the solutions that I see as important ways forward for our people for our children, and uh, yeah, so in, in what I'm doing in, in our little neck of the woods of uh, Muri Whenua Kaitaia. So I'm really, really privileged to be here today, actually inspired again to be Māori, listening to our students welcome us, hearing our reo, our mihi, um, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so of I've come away from my clinic in Kaitai and it's a um, real privilege. I've been at the opportunity to have someone working there. But to come away from my clinic and I, I liken it to sort of coming out of the, the trenches and to come into a more strategic position because being here today inspires me as, as much as I hope to be able to inspire you with some of the things I may have done or may consider to be doing. I, um, I have a photo here and um, if you've seen it before, aroha mai tātama. The, the, the photo here is, uh, is what drives me, actually. Uh, it's, it's a photo of my, myself and my son. So there's Lance and Lance Jr. <laughs> so we have seven children. So when you have seven children, you run out of unique names. <laughs> and he, he gets lumbered with uh, Lance Jr. So... I feel for my, I don't know how my grandmother did it with 18 children. She s still seemed to have very unique names. But, um, so the, the photo here is of a father and a son embracing, a father looking into his son's eyes and holding him up high and knowing that he's going to have the all, every opportunity to achieve greatness, 
to contribute to our people and our society, our country as a whole, he's going to be uh, dynamic and energetic and and it's exciting for a father to see. And, and the converse to that is a son looking into his father's eyes and realising that he is a father that will provide protection, uh, role modelling, keep him safe and give him advice and direction when it's needed. So this is a photo moment, this is a Kodak moment that I think every parent, every father, son, mother, child, daughter should should experience in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And we, it would be clear to, fair to say that this is not always the case. Not everyone has the opportunity to have this Kodak moment in our country. And so I guess things have led me to be where I am in Kaitaia uh, and led me to be passionate about what I'm doing currently in Kaitaia. I'm really excited to say that every, well, most days, most days I say I'm, I'm, I'm doing the job I dreamed of doing when I embarked on a career in medicine. And that's really rewarding to be able to say. I, I would like to hopefully not bore you, but give you a bit of background as to what led to the person that's standing in front of you today. I, I believe it keep, is in keeping with the theme of the kingitanga in terms of leadership, in terms of passion in ter for our people, in terms of a solutions-focused approach to how we address the needs of our communities. So I'm going to bore you with a little bit about where things started for me. <clears throat> so it started with a, a young Pākehā mother who ran into this um, charming, handsome, I believe, Māori Ngāti, Ngāti Maru, Ngāti, uh, Ngāti Ho, Te Rarawa, um, man in the South Island who's on a freezing work journey um, around the country. But quite quickly it ended up with it being a, a solo mother, a solo Pākehā mother raising two or three, at that time we referred to, as, as you're aware, half-caste children in the eastern suburbs of, of Auckland. Uh, a solo mother that did her best on a domestic purposes benefit to raise her children, to have aspirations, hopes and dreams to be a positive contributor to society. And we, we witnessed that with our mother who was in, active in, in our community. So the eastern suburbs of Auckland at that time, I think you could count on one hand how many Māori or dark-skinned people were in the community. And so it was a bit... Uh, it was a little bit isolated at times, culturally. So I had a Pākehā mother um, raising us who didn't have the knowledge of the culture that over time would be seen to be a really important part of, of who I wanted to be. Now, the challenge of being raised in a community such as that is there was a lot of discrimination. You know, discrimination on the basis of class, discrimination on the basis of race, and discrimination on the basis of... Uh, being from a solo parent family. So quite quickly, for some reason, or for those reasons, um, you know, this, this particular person um, you know, was finding trouble in the teachers, uh, with the teachers and, and being in the principal's office more often than not. Um, being told, his mother being told that um, the child had a learning disability and, uh, and not, not surprisingly... <clears throat> This is a position I often found myself in. So sitting in the corner with the dunce's hat on, <clears throat> you know, actually getting, um, uh, getting bribed to have good behaviour and to be committed to learning. And um, so it was a really interesting point in my life and, and I think really interesting because it shapes how I am today in, in a few ways because the question was, was it the, the student that was incapable of learning, or was it a system that was incapable of teaching? Similarly, if I look at my job as a doctor, are the health statistics we see, uh, health outcomes due to uh, a group of people that are incapable of being healthy, or a health system that's incapable of reaching their needs? I think the parallels there are really, really quite true and really quite... Um, they, they resonate with m what my approach to 
to delivering health care. So quite quickly, when you get into this situation where your reputation precedes you into, into the school you know, that um, you're going to next, that you're actually not very smart and you're actually a bit of a troublemaker, quite quickly, this is, this is the outcome. A disinterested student sitting at the back of the class who's not, that, that, not reaching the potential. So this, um, this was where I was at. And so what happened was quite short, shortly after this, uh, this is not, obviously not me, but I got expelled from my first college. <clears throat> so I was expelled from a, a college in Auckland. And, uh, and my mother, realising that she couldn't um, deliver what I needed at times, to be honest, getting quite frustrated and, uh, you know, throwing her hands in the air, decided she'd send me to an uncle and an auntie down in uh, South Island, Timaru, uh, an uncle of uh, Ngati Pro uh, descent and her sister. She thought there was an opportunity there to, for, my, for myself to, be, to have the, the learnings that I needed, which was those cultural, those cultural aspects of who I was as a young Māori man that were lacking. Unfortunately, I went down there, and that's where I got expelled from my second secondary school. <laughs> and, uh, and as you know, I thought I'd reflect on that. It was, uh, it was a challenging time. My grandmother, my mother's mother, took me along to the, the rector. It's a Presbyterian school in Timaru, who recently denied that I ever went there. Because <laughs> they said, no, we didn't expel the New Zealand of the year. <laughs> but I have different recollections of it. <laughs> it was a hall similar to this, and I got made to stand up and go to the principal's office in front of about 300 or 800 boys. Um, but my, my grandmother went along on her Sunday best to, to get me into the school, so it's quite it was quite a thing for me to get expelled from that school after all she'd done. So uh, so what happened then was this is a this is a trajectory, this is a pathway into um, un unfortunately into a situation many of our young people face, which was this was not a person that was achieving their potential. And uh, and again, if I reflect on if we reflect on it today, the the question had to be asked: What was failing? Was the student failing? Was the system, you know, student failing the student? So my um, mother, in, in desperation, because we, we had been asked, uh, she had asked the local Catholic boarding school in Auckland, Saint Great Heart, if I could go there. The, the only possibility was if I um, did well in Timaru. So that sort of was gone. <laughs> when I came back to Auckland, they said, "Well, sorry, the deal's off." So um, the next thing happened was she applied to two Māori boarding schools in Auckland. So one was uh, St. Stephen's and the other was Hato Petero. Tēnei tēnei te mitia, mitia tu ki a koe a tā taubi, tēnei hare ko ki te ao koe i tēnei wā, ki te whakarungo ki tāku kōrero ki te hunga nei, nō rei mihi ana ki a koe anō, ki a koe anō hoki sera, mō tō pāpa. Nā, nā rāua i, i, i tautoko tēnei uh, te maiti hautatu. <laughs> so um, so uh, um, I, this is, and before I talk about um, which school I ended up going to, for those who may have not picked it up already, <laughs> this is the opportunity for me to actually witness and be a part of a, a pathway into Māori leadership. And I think it's imp important today because we are here to recognise the important contribution of the Kingi Zanga to m the development of Māori leaders. Um, I witnessed at, at the kura I went to, uh, my first engagement with the Kingi Tanga was being able to come down to coronation and be involved in um, the Kingi Tanga at that time. And since then I've had uh, further opportunities to, to reflect on the importance, the very, very real importance of the Kingi Tanga for, for our people. So, so the kura I ended up going to was um, Hato Petero College, and um, Sir Toby Curtis was the principal of the day, and um, and the other kura I we never received a letter back from or any response. The other kura, um, yeah, my mother applied to, we didn't hear back from. So we went along to an interview with um, Sir Toby and my mother and I, and um, fortunately, Sir Toby. Um, may have seen the potential and uh, 
and actually we're, I was privileged to be able to enter into a realm of learning who I was as a young Māori. And that was, that really started my pathway into, to, into Māori leadership. Um, I was able to witness there um, the people who would show me and display to me uh, what it meant to be a proud Māori man. Um, Sarah's father, Sir Toby, uh, Sarah's father, David, uh, sorry, um, Lang, and, um, and, and then realising that as a young Māori person, there was a lot more to be proud about. There's a lot more in terms of the potential to achieve uh, and, and provide leadership. It was, it was the turning point in my life, I was going to Hartle Peterhead College. And the turning point was learning those really important aspects of who I was. So I remember the first day, uh, Sir Toby, I was, I was going into the boarding um, hostel and one of the Maris brothers came up to me and said, uh, his name was Brother Mark, he's now f um, Father Mark, and he said to me, um, so where are you from, uh, young man? And I said, oh, Pakaranga. <laughs> so this is a Pākehā Maris brother said to me, oh, Pakuranga. And I never said Pakuranga again. <laughs> that sense of shame. It, it actually has come across me one other time uh, in my life. And that was um, as I'd graduated as a Māori doctor and I was working at Rotorua and uh, a doctor who was training me at the time, a Pākehā doctor from Southland, uh, said, uh, it witnessed me going out into, my room, into the waiting room picking up a patient saying, um, Oh, honey Smith, honey Timete. Oh, hi, my name's Lance Sullivan. Come on through. And he said to me later, I thought you would have said kia ora, Lance. And it was really important because those, uh, you know, real gentle reminders about remembering who I was or in the first place was learning who I was. But also I think coming out of medical school had a little bit of deconstruction has to go on, remembering ke hoki ana ki te, e hoki ana ki te, ki tōku tino, uh, uh, rangatira pia. Uh, so, so yeah, it, Peter the College was an opportunity. Peter the College was an opportunity for me to discover what it meant to be a leader, or, or the the aspirations, I guess, of providing leadership. And so today, um, you know, I'm, I don't have a wide circle of um, people I, I move in because Kaitai is a small community. <laughs> but I, you know, we recognise and see the wonderful new generation of Māori leaders that are out there that are doing some amazing things. Um, and um, actually quite a few of those on the slide are from Waikato University. And I might just make a note about Waikato University. And um, When I left Hartle Peter to college before I went into medical school, I actually left a college of 250 um, you know, boys, boarding school of 250 boys, and went to the University of Auckland, which was 20,000, and it was a complete cultural shock. And um, I actually didn't last there very long. And it was interesting because I, the consideration was to come to Waikato, where a lot of my um, friends and peers had come from Hato. And in, in, in hindsight, it would have been interesting to see, you know, the, the experience, the different experience I would have had coming to a university which embraces in a wholehearted way um, Māori tanga and now, no doubt, the ongoing commitment to Kingi Tanga Day, uh, Alistair, um, as a reflection of that. Uh, yeah, and so, oh, look, it's, it's really exciting. We, we as a people, we as a nation, as a society, should be really excited about the, the type of leaders that are coming through. And like I say, this is just a snapshot of those that are um, showing leadership. I'll talk a little bit more about um, Hawe Averko, who some of you may know later on. So... My job, I'll talk to you, so I'm a doctor by training, so I went to Auckland Medical School under something called the Māori and um, Pacific Island Admission Scheme, the purpose of which is to increase the number of Māori doctors, which at, at any time in the recent near future was something like 3% of the medical practitioner population. We have 15, we represent 15% 15 of the New Zealand population and probably about 30% of the sick population, so there's a huge gap between the, um, the number of Māori doctors and the number of, that were required and that there actually were. 
there. And uh, Sir Toby's daughter, uh, daughter uh, Elena Curtis, has been doing a lot to increase the number of Māori doctors, so much so that I think there'd be, at any given time in the University of Auckland, the University of Otago, somewhere between 150 um, and 200 Māori medical students in training, which means every year for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we'll be having 150 to 200 Māori doctors graduating. So that's, that's exciting. So my job is, um, is working in the clinic, I work in, and I love the community kaitai. I look forward to going home tomorrow. I, um, I'll give you a little example of a, a, a story about this. Uh, the clinic, I don't know if I've got it, yeah, the consultation room is anything from the main street of Kaitaia <laughs> to a swimming pool, which is a really interesting event there, to my room obviously, but also to somewhere like Pack and Save. <laughs> so a little story, forgive me if you've already heard it, I don't know but um, so the story goes like this. I was in Pack and Save. I was in the cereal aisle seeking out some nutritious, you know, low sugar, low fat <laughs> cereal. And it's, well, a patient comes up to me and goes, Doctor, Doctor, I've got a lump on my dick. <laughs> and I said, OK, so I did my, put my clinical hat on and asked him a few more questions. And, um, and then I, um, two things happened. Number one, I uh, referred the man to a urologist, and a urologist is a, a dick doctor. <laughs> and the other thing is I never went down a cereal aisle for about 12 months. <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a funny side to the fact that my job in the community I live in, and that's why I love my job in Kaitaia, is it's, it happens, 50% of what I do is in the doctor's room, and the other 50% has been in my community knowing my people, knowing our people, um, helping our people when they need it, actually. Um, and it might be at the, rugby, the sideline of the rugby field, it may be at the supermarket, it may be at the, the farmer's market, whatever it may be, maybe in their homes. And that's really exciting. I'm really, really privileged to have a set of skills that allows me to be able to help people in any particular venue. So oh, I'll show you a little bit about my whanau. The story is... Um, so we have, we have seven children who have been through career education. Um, and I guess when I reflect on that photo at the beginning, I'm, and I was saying this to a, a, person, a friend or a colleague of mine this morning, uh, I'm really assured that these people are going to, these young citizens, these young Māori are going to be um, bright, positive contributors to our people, to our nation. The exciting thing for me is how can we add a little bit of that brightness to others in our community and in our country, so and, and in particular around the, the youth and the young people, our children, our mokopuna. So this is not a parting challenge. This is a so I'm, I'm a little bit of background to us who I am. The next part of the corridor is about well, so I had this this bucket load of passion, passion that was born out of uh, a realization of who I was. I then acquired some skills at the medical school, Auckland Medical School, and then the realisation was I knew that there was a problem, there was an issue, how do we, you know, what is the issue and how do we address it? So the problem for me, and this is a, a slide I use for doctors um, practising in Northland, doctors at a national conference, the, the, the issue for me is, is that th this, is the, this is the problem here. In Northland, and this, the census start of 2013, in Northland, 48% of children between the ages of zero and four will be Māori. So one in two children. But by the time you get to over 65 years of age, only one in eight will be, will be Māori. So how do we go from being one in two to one in eight? Well, there's a the possibility of immigra immigrating out of the region, but having said that, there are higher numbers of over 65-year-olds in Northland than there is nationally. So we're not moving out of the region and going elsewhere in the country because actually there's, a, you're, there's less chance of you being over 65 as a Māori elsewhere in the country or nationally. So we could be leaving the country and never coming back. We certainly could be leaving the region and never coming back. But my greatest concern is that this re reflects premature death under the age of 65, internationally is defined as a premature death. We lose out on superannuation, we lose out on this important transfer of cultural knowledge and cultural integrity. 
Um, and the things for me as a, as a doctor is that a lot of diseases affecting our children, a lot of diseases affecting our, our young adults, and obviously our older adults into kaumatua hood uh, are causing this significant reduction in our potential. So, so much so that I'll, I'll challenge a doctor in Northland and say, on Monday, so today's Thursday, on Monday you're going to see you're going to see a whole lot of Māori children. One in, two of, uh, one in two of the children under the age of four will be Māori when they come in onto your clinic on Monday morning. But three out of four of those children that you see that are Māori will die prematurely in their lifetime. So my question to you as doctors, health funders, whatever it may be, is how are you going to address that? How can you actually stop those three or reduce the three out of four Māori children coming in dying prematurely of any number of diseases at any stage in their life. Rheumatic heart disease, bronchiectasis, um, meningitis, suicide, road traffic accidents, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. So we, up until a few years ago, two years ago actually, two and a half years ago, I was a salaried doctor working in a system which I felt really didn't display the leadership that was required to really turn around our people's health. The health of Māori and Kaitaia. So, so I ended up finding my own way into, into a position where we could, um, we could set up something that would allow us to say, what do we think our people need and how can we deliver it? So we being my wife and I, so Tracy, um, and so we set up a clinic called Te Kohanga Whakaora, Nā Matua Hekta i, i Tukumaitera Ingoa, uh, so the nest of wellness. And so we, we, we opened up a clinic where we thought would um, serve the needs of our people on the terms that they, they needed, um, the, the terms that, that they required to access healthcare. So it wasn't rocket science and it wasn't new, but we were, we were looking at trying to shift the model of care a little bit. So we, we said, oh, look, we won't have any appointments in the morning. Uh, we just have a walk-in clinic. Our people, when I was working in a clinic before this, would have appointments to see a, a patient, but they wouldn't turn up. And the reason they wouldn't turn up is because when you ring for an appointment, it's on that particular time of the day, of the week, of the, of the month that you need that care, not two or three days down the track or even three weeks down the track, and especially for our people. If our people's barriers to healthcare is that they don't have a phone, or if they do have a cell phone, they only have 50 cents credit on it, and they can't afford to spend time waiting on the, on the line to the receptionist, or the, rece the appointment that they get is not suitable for them, then all of those things are going to be a bridge too far. So we said, look, we'll just open the doors and let our people come in when they, when they need the care. It was a little bit uh, radical because... Actually, doctors don't like to turn up in the morning and see that their day can be anything from zero to, to, to zero patients to um, 50, um, because that's outside of our comfort zone. But I believe and I feel really comfortable that we actually need to get outside of that comfort zone and re rethink the way we deliver healthcare, especially to communities such as Māori. So it's been incredibly successful, stressful, busy. Um, but I go home, I work harder than I ever have, um, my bills are a lot higher than they've ever been. The, uh, it's all uncertain. Every day is uncertain. But I feel so much happy about the fact that I'm doing what I went to medical school to do. I'm doing what I dreamed I could be possible of, uh, achieve what I could be possible, possibly achieve when I was dreaming at Hartel Peter that I could be a Māori doctor at medical school, that I could be providing health leadership. So that's, that's really exciting. It reignited the passion, I guess. And I guess if I look at it, it was a bit of a cycle. I went to Hartsville Peter, I was inspired, the passion was, was burning fiercely. I went to medical school and learned a whole lot of Western ideas of medicine and Western models of care. And then the passion sort of got compromised a bit. I was, a, you know, I was in the system and it was compromised further and it required a bit of a step out to... Um, it could require a bit of courage, a little bit of risk taking to actually say this is not what I want to end up being remembered for. So we also 
then looked at, okay, so we offer models of care where we, which are a bit different in terms of general practice, but we also need to look at how we shift the doctor's care from the clinic into the environments that our people live, work and play in, the environments that uh, they're already there and are safer and more uh, familiar to them. So we, we've, we've, got a, we've got a school program in Kaitai called the Moko program, hugely successful. Um, Manawa Ora Koro Koro Ora, so it comes out of a rheumatic fever program, but we've, decided, we've tried to branch out on more than just sore throats and rheumatic fever, which is an important issue, but we were also, we were also being told, hey, look, the other, issue, other issues our children face are skin infections and, and kutu. So we've looked at responding to the, the call of our whānau and also our teachers. It's about shifting the model, of, the venue of care. So we believe that will ac increase access for health care. So we've got a really good health system in New Zealand, but it's not accessible to everyone. So how do we sh increase access? And importantly, culturally competent care. I, I think if we measured culturally incompetent care and said you know, what number of deaths occur because of culturally incompetent care, we'd be shocked and dismayed to realise that um, a person died because... There was, a, there was a gap between the cultural competency of the health practitioner and the patient. We, we measure clinical competency, so we say you as a doctor should be able to set, take a set of symptoms and diagnose uh, and investigate and treat those set of symptoms. And if you don't, if the gap's too wide, we'll say you're clinically incompetent because harm occurred. Someone died, someone required to be in hospital, hospitalisation. But we don't measure culturally competent um, issues. Although there's a start to do that and there's been some really good work around the development of culturally competent clinical guidelines. But it's a real challenge because we, we don't, I don't, well many people would agree we don't do it well enough. <coughs> so sick kids are a real important issue for us in, in a community and it's no doubt it is here and actually I know it is in Waikato. I know it is in Bay of, Plenty, Bay of Plenty, South Auckland, East Coast, Porirua, the areas where our, our people uh, uh, congregate. So because these children are trying to learn, they're trying to learn while they have illnesses that are particularly disabling. And, um, you know, so we are, we're, if we think, if we believe that education and uh, Sir Toby, uh, as a stalwart of education, would agree. If education is the key to lifting our people out of poverty, lifting our people out of unemployment, uh, giving our people uh, more opportunities to participate in the society, if education is truly the key, then how can we have children going to school with these, these conditions, expecting them to not be distracted by pain, not be distracted by itch or mamai, or to be able to focus on the teacher in the front of them? So we, we're sort of looking at how can we create a venue uh, in the schools for helping our educationists to teach by keeping the children healthy. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what, what, what that actually means. It's a little, this is a slide a little bit around cultural competency uh, and what the burden of some of these diseases that are seemingly benign and innocuous. Um, so this is a young child who's six months of age who had uh, this facial rash on the, on the left-hand side here for about three or four months. Actually, access to care was pretty good for this mother, so young Māori mother in her 20s. Access to care was pretty good. She'd seen a doctor three or four times. The doctor, the doctor or a series of doctor, doctors had given them... Um, what I'd call in a culturally inappropriate treatment. They weren't looking at this Māori child with the view that there's, there's a high risk of some super infection called MRSA and, and bugs that are resistant to traditional antibiotic treatment. Um, you know, and and this, this mother would be looked at perhaps going down the street with a child like this and, and people might frown upon it and say, frown upon the, the mother and, hey, what sort of mother would allow their child to have this? Uh, on their face and they'll see it time and time again and they'll, they'll judge that mother, that Māori mother, and say, what a, um, that, that's neglect, that's you know, lack of care and treatment, 
they probably aren't taking their child to the doctor, despite the fact that this mother had taken the child three to four times. So the child came to Kaitai and, and came to see us, and um, so with my cultural lens on, I'm saying, well, that's probably got uh, an infection which is common among Māori populations. And, and sure enough, we do a swab and we, we give the child treatment on the suspicion that this child has the... Uh, a condition that's very common in Māori communities. So this is three to four months, and this is three to four days after treatment. So, so this mother was almost in tears bringing the child to us, and, and equally in tears when she brought back the child to say, I'm so excited you were able to help our child. And, and the only difference between what we were doing and what the, the care was that the child was getting previously was a lack of the cultural lens, the cultural competency. So we, we think what we're doing in our, in our clinic but also in our community programs is showing leadership in the, in the area of helping Māori communities, in particular Māori, vulnerable Māori children. So, so currently we have a clinic and currently we have a service that goes into the schools. So in Kaitai we have 2,000 children that are getting served by we have a staff of 20 staff working for us, and the staff, uh, half of them are in the clinic, half of them are in the schools, and they go around the schools three times a week. 14 schools, 2,000 children having health checks. So we had people in, outside of our, 2000, our community of 2,000 children saying, OK, how can you help us? Because we see the, the work that's happening in Kaitaia, but we live in Tahapua. We live in Tokoa. And we, we, we live in uh, Rangiaf or Karikari, and we don't have access to the services and we would like something. So, so that required a little bit of leadership in the area of, well, let's look at something innovative and let's look at developing something where we can, we can't take people into those communities. We can't send people 120 kilometres to, uh, to Harp or three times a week, but we can use some technology that we could develop and so we've developed a telemedicine program in, in the far north, and it's reaching remote communities and it's using innovation. So the communities I'm talking about, you know, we're in Kaitaia, and the communities uh, we're looking at serving with this program is up in Tahapu, what's it called, you know, all around this sort of particular area, up to 120 kilometres away. And what we're using, or what we're doing is we're thinking, so these are children that are going to school. So this is what we're seeing in Kaitai on any given day. So the approach is, is that child going to be able to learn and concentrate with those, with those um, wounds all over them? And the answer from any clinical person I talk to is no. Any teacher we talk to is no. So we, we think if we use some technology, we can actually capture some of this information in these remote communities and send it back to a doctor or a nurse 120 k's away to analyse, diagnose, treat. So what, we, what we've done with this program, uh, it's been about nine months to prepare it and put it to the ministry, is we give people like a digital thermometer and some digital scales and a digital pulse oximeter. So everyone would have been to the doctors and had things put in the ears and on their fingers and we won't go any further, but you know what I mean? So to this digital age, this technology, there's an opportunity to use technology to, to um, span the gap that exists because of geographic barriers, maybe span the gap that exists because of socioeconomic barriers or even cultural barriers. So I'm really excited as a Māori doctor to be leading this program in the far north because it is purely, the, the heart of it is actually improved access for my, our people. And that's really exciting. Um, it's just a, re it's a pilot project and it's really new and simple and robust and a little bit cumbersome and it's, and it's in the, where it is at the moment, but we're really excited about where it can go. So, so we have this equipment that we give to members of the community that um, we train on how to use. They're volunteers from the community. The most, the most important aspect of this uh, program is, is that we're not going in there as doctors and nurses and saying, delivering the health care. We're actually going in with tools and then we're stepping back. So we're empowering communities to look after themselves. Technology has that potent ability to do that. 
technology allows us to say, hey, look, if I train you how to use a smart device, because it's all smart device based, application based, if I give you some clinical tools, like uh, these digital tools, um, you can then care for your, your own family. Now, why that's important is I, I would feel a lot more empowered if I was a, as, a, as a parent or as a member of the community knowing that the, the health care for our people is in our hands more so than just saying it is. Um, and we hope that this program, if we assess the people in the community today in terms of their knowledge around health issues and then assess them again in four years' time at the end of our pilot project, we think they're going to have greater health knowledge and greater health literacy, which is going to improve, I, I, th I believe, you know, down the track further improved health outcomes. So the actual program we're doing, which is treating children, is one part of it. The treating the communities, educating the communities, and empowering the communities is probably the greater part of what we're doing. So we're using this. So the the staff that are volunteers, they use this to take a photo. They use this to take the temperature and the pulse rate. And if everything checks out and they're okay, they're not sick enough that we should be seeing the doctor today. And the photo shows. You know, if there's a photo showing something like this that gets sent to us, to doctor and a nurse in Kaitaia, and then we arrange for them to get some antibiotics. And the antibiotics go on a real delivery to the kids in Taapo. The next day, generally. But these things here, have, if we don't treat them, they'll be there for weeks, if not longer. So we think a 12-hour delay is reasonable if it means they're going to get antibiotics sooner. This idea that haki haki are just something that will go away over time, it's actually wrong because we know that it causes significant illness. We know it causes kidney disease. There's a link to rheumatic heart disease. There's, um, it causes joint and bone damage and infection. So, the uh, whakamua is the fact that uh, th this is, the technology available today is going to be vastly different to the technology available tomorrow. And what we're doing today is a very simple program. We're taking photos of kin's, uh, children's skin infections and we're arranging treatment to get to them. So it's, it's convenient care on their terms. It's in their school. It's a more familiar site than going to the doctors. They don't have to pay 100 you know, um, fuel costs for a, a return trip of 100, 200 kilometres. We as a health system will benefit from this because if we treat these skin infections earlier, we're not going to admit them into hospital and uh, the hospital costs at eight to $1,200 a day. You know, that's unaffordable for a health system. So, so going forward, this is an exciting type of technology available. The, I'll, I'll talk more about this little, this here. Um, everyone recognises that as a stethoscope. So it's a stethoscope with a hard drive. It's a hard drive that has Bluetoothable capability. You can record 12, 30-second sound bites on it. So... I'm sort of toying with this idea, this exciting possibility. What if we had a person in uh, Tahoroa who had um, problems with uh, a chesty cough and we could get, have a whānau, a dedicated whānau order advocate, champion, um, who could actually use something like this. And all it is is plug and play. Six, six um, sites on the front of the chest recording 12, 30-second sound bites front and back putting it on, Bluetoothing it to your server, which we download in Waikato, uh, and maybe, maybe making a decision on treatment, maybe saying, hey, look, this child's okay, this child's not okay, this child could have this treatment, and we can review that child again tomorrow. You know, this, this is just something we're toying with, but the idea is we have to look uh, at the horizon on what's on the horizon, and if that means greater reduction in, 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 in equitable disease, then that's, um, that ticks all the boxes for me, and as, as I'm sure it is for you. So uh, the, the final cup quarter I was going to talk about in terms of supporting the theme of the day, which is around Māori leadership, is, is that, oh, we've, we've created a charitable foundation in, in Kaitā. So we had incredible support from mainstream New Zealand for the fact that vulnerable children not receiving what they need in terms of services, vulnerable communities not receiving what they need in terms of uh, access to care was not right. And this came from a large section of non-Māori New Zealand. So that was really encouraging. Um, 
we had a, a lady who sent a cheque for thirty thousand dollars because she heard me talking about the fact that people should not have to get their medication because they can't afford the prescription charges. That was really encouraging for me as a Māori doctor, Māori um, champion for our people of the far north, that someone in Auckland, someone who looks quite different to me and you and comes from quite a different background actually says that's, that's not right and this is my sense of support for it. So we, we created this foundation which is really exciting and it's around, it has sort of three main focuses, health, education and leadership. And the first thing is around this leader, uh, Hawe Virko Leaders Scholarship. Hawe was a graduate of Waikato University and my dear friend and, um, and tragically passed away a number of years ago. His contribution to Māori leadership, I believe, shouldn't be forgotten and shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't die with, with him. So we, I created this scholarship and the idea of the scholarship is that for 12 months we have a scholar that will will sit with me, have mentoring sessions, attend hui like this and witness leadership in action. And we'll put them all through our leadership course. It's just we as me and my wife. But <laughs> the idea is, you know, that second or third slide with all those leaders of today, my hope is that in five years' time we'll have 50 or 100 Hare Virko leaders, scholars, scholarship mentors that will say, we want to see a pathway to leadership for Māori youth that happens by design, not by chance. I believe, well, someone like myself, the pathway to leadership has been through chance. And I always wonder what, what could have happened if I was mentored by someone at age 17 who sat with me every month, talked to me about my aspirations. So this is our, um, our Ezekiel Rawi from Taipa Area School in Kaitai. He's the inaugural 2014 Hawe Virko Scholar. He wants to be first Māori Prime Minister. So uh, he doesn't want to be a doctor, and that's not the point. He wants to be a leader, and he's always showing amazing, amazing leadership as a 16-year-old. And so he, um, so we, we had him down at uh, an event in Auckland, but the, the, the thing is he wants to be a judge first before he becomes a, a Prime Minister. Small dreams. So, so our first thing to do is to, you know, next week him and I and Greg, Judge Greg Davis are going to have lunch. I can't support him on a career pathway to, to law, but I could introduce him to a Māori judge in Northland who can help support his aspirations of going through uh, being, being a, a judge and then on to being the Prime Minister. The other thing, so we, it's about mentoring and leadership for um, our youth. You know, these are young Māori who want to be doctors. These are young Māori that just want to know about dreams. So after I won the Sir Peter, Sir Peter Blake Emerging Leader, I went around to the, lo the local schools and talked to them about the award, about leadership, about having dreams. So Sir Peter Blake Trust has a really clear um, program on planting dreams, the seed of dreams into children's minds. It's amazing. I went and spoke about dreams and still kids 12 months later are coming up and telling me about their dream card. It's, it's really powerful, the idea of suggestion, the, the concept of suggesting this. So we also, we're also looking at the environment people live in. So we know that, as a doctor, we know that giving people a prescription for an asthma attack or an infection of the chest or a skin infection and sending them home to homes like this is money in a hole in the ground. More importantly, it's a missed opportunity for improved health outcomes. So we've been working a little bit with people, and some of those people are from Hamilton. Some of those companies are from Hamilton. And they, this, is, this is true medicine. This is true health care. This is a home that had five, uh, a family of five mokapuna and a grandmother living in this house that was leaking. The, house was, the roof was leaking. They had the oven open and the oven turned up high to heat the lounge. They didn't live in the other two bedrooms because they were damaged by domestic violence. They were damaged by, because of disrepair. And that no amount of prescription medication is going to fix the health of this family. It was, so we, we had this um, a company from Hamilton who said, we like what you're saying about improving people's health by improving the environment. And so they came up and donated a whole brand new roof for this family. That was probably the most successful health outcome I achieved for, this fa for anyone in, in probably 
eight or nine years of practicing kaitā. And this is our son who's um, on his pathway to medicine. This is uh, a psychology uh, student who's with us, and this is a medical student. And on this particular day, I was on call for the hospital, and there's great reception from the roof here to the hospital. <laughs> I had my scrub, green scrubs on, taking calls from the ED nurses here. But um, powerful, uh, a view, powerful view on the health determinants for our whanau from that roof. So I, I'm just going to finish by, um, by, by, by saying I hope, I hope my talk today has supported the theme of the day in the sense of leadership, in the sense of the passion that we all bring to this, this kaupapa. I, uh, I really do feel that blessed when every day I'm, I'm riding to work and I can ride past the children of Kaitai and I know we're making a difference to what their, what their health outcomes and their, therefore their potential could be. Really excited about the possibility of reaching out further than the, the Northland region. It's about being an advocate and uh, I guess in a quiet way a protester. And now protesters by getting out and doing the work, challenging my colleagues, challenging the health system. And I really like this quote from um, this um, African-American orator and it really summed up, I was at a conference recently and I heard this and I've, uh, I'm going to read his book, but, you know, if we can start with our children, our mokopuna, it's the prevention of, of disease and, and unwellness into the future is, is far more um, cost effective than trying to repair broken people. And of the cost being, the cost to our country in terms of health system, the cost to the whanau and the and the individual in terms of their, the, the harm, the harm of having to sit in hospital for six to eight weeks with a child with rheumatic fever. And uh, so, yeah, this, that's a fitting way to close my quarter. Um, just to say uh, thank you once again, Linda, and, um, and Alison and the, and the staff of Te Whare Wānonga Waikato. Ko te mea, ko te mihi nui ki a koutou, uh, e, e noho noho nei tini wā, uh, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou katoa.